This is the Nomad Futurist Podcast. A podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and transformation. Connect with us, share your thoughts with us at nomadfuturist.com. Let's get this started. Here are Phil and Nabil. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Nomad Futurist. This is your co-host Nabil Mahmood from Waikolo, Hawaii. This is your co-host Philip Koblenz from Montclair, New Jersey. And this is special shining guest star, Anna Claiborne, coming to you from <laughs> the glamorous Penryn, California, which no one will ever have a clue where that is. So it's between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe, I just saved everybody pulling up Google Maps. Well, yeah. Isn't that where people want to sort of like semi-retire, like still live in California and yet go to Tahoe? <laughs> yes. It, this is so I actually live in wine country. It's not Napa wine country, so it's not the most popular wine country, but it is a big wine county. So it is kind of where people come to retire and like make a winery. Yeah. Yeah. But was it them that they actually started naming it Zappa Valley or was that back out east because it was a Napa Valley? That one? I don't know. That's a filled question because that has to do with back east. So that's it. That's all his territory. Oh, right, brilliant. As the, well, as, the, as, as, as the East Coast representative, I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, when you're actually introducing yourself, I thought it was like Liz Claiborne. I mean, that was very, very close. So thank you for the introduction. Lovely meeting. Any you. relation? Lovely Any relation? Let's start. Yeah. That would be the first question. I, that is a good question. And I honestly don't know. I know that the Claiborne name comes from back east. And I know that it also, one of my relatives way back there was like in the original Jamestown settlement. So it's like, I know that I think, we've been here for a while, so I wouldn't be surprised I, if there I, was some I relation. I think well, we might have to have like a follow-up episode after we do like a 23 and Me, and see if you should at the very least get a discount on cosmetics. <laughs> I think she's more well-known for her clothing rather than cosmetics. All right, Phil, that's too fast. That's how much I've got to square away now. Oh, my God, I got, a, <laughs> I, I got a lot of work to do. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for taking the time to join us today. Let's start to get to know you a little bit. So could you... Tell our audience, again, at a very high level, what you do and who is Anna Claiborne? Ooh, wow. That's heavy, heavy, heavy questions for at first. What do, what do I do and who am I? Well, who am I? You know, it's funny. I actually got asked this question not that long ago. And I had to think about it. And I was like, really? Who am I? What is it that I enjoy? Problem solving. I really am a problem solver. And I think you'll hear a lot of engineers say that. It's a very common theme with engineers. But when I was really forced to think about it, I enjoy problems and I enjoy like taking them apart, looking at them from different angles and then figuring out not just a solution, but all possible solutions and really looking at those. And, you know, like I said, I don't think it's that rare for engineers to explain themselves as, you know, that's who they fundamentally are. But that's definitely one of the things that defines me. And as far as what, what do I do? Well, I've done a lot of startups as part of that because startups are the best space that we have in this capitalistic society to explore problems and be able to pick them apart and do all these things and still make a good living and support yourself and your family and do all the things. And so the startup track has been a wonderful venue for that for me. And so I've done quite a few startups. I've also spent stints in corporate America too at two different times. So I've been part of bigger companies. And so, yeah, that's what I've done. And, and most of the problems that I've solved have been around software and infrastructure. I don't know how it ended up that I came into contact with infrastructure so much, but I've always loved software ever since I was a, a kid and first started playing video games. Like, do you remember Doom? Is, am, am, am I dating yeah. myself too severely? No, here? no, no. We, we're still the young ones. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> So playing that and I like trying to figure out like a sound card and sending out a setting like the IRQs and like getting my first sound card configured and figuring and thinking about video games. There's another video game, Descent, that was like this. It was like a very it was one of the first really 3D oriented games. And so that really got me into thinking about, well, how do you make this stuff work? You know, like, how does this actually work? And I ended up getting a job in the IT world. I worked for a bank doing IT and I worked on a lot of Novell servers, Windows NT 4.0, Cisco yeah, switches, I don't know that branches. Doomed, I don't know. I don't know that Doom dated yourself. I think <laughs> Windows NT 4.0 might have dated yourself. Yeah, I, I know. I was, I was I a know. real aficionado of Windows Workgroups 3.11. That yeah. was my jam. 
<laughs> yeah. I remember I was I used to sit there and like make copies of all the Windows 3.11 installation disks so I could go like install. How many computer. floppies did it take you to install your first operating system, Anna? Well, I, I think I, our I, audience I, is going to need to know what a floppy <laughs> is. <laughs> I know. I know. Are you a three and a half inch floppy or are you five and a quarter? Like what? what, what is your type? <laughs> oh my God. There are so many uh, t-shirts that we can make. I know. I know. It's uh -huh. the the past is a gold mine of uh of fun tech stuff. But those that don't understand it are bound to repeat it. Ah, oh, that is true. I wonder when the floppy disk is going to come back around. I mean, everything right. te tech pretty is like soon. fashion. Yeah, like I'm, I think it's going to be pretty soon, especially with quantum, right? So we will have to go into the binary storage again. Quantum floppy disks. There yes. you go. Yeah, we, we, we might be this, onto something. How do we make this happen? Because there's, there's, seriously. Tech is fashion. Whatever, it all just comes back around again. You know, we used mm -hmm. to be, oh, mainframes are all the rage. And then it's like, no, we all need PCs. And now everyone's like, cloud's the, the rage. It's like, okay, so cool. We're going back to mainframes. The, the, awesome. the, the, bell, the bell bottoms of the tech world. Oh, they are back. <laughs> <laughs> they are <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. the, they, they're not called the bell bottoms anymore, Phil, just so you know. It's oh, the wide, yeah. it's yeah. The wide I mean, leg. I want to figure out what Liz Claiborne sells, <laughs> right? So what do I know? This is not. All right. Yes. So let's 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 go back just a bit in time. I mean, there's a lot that we have to cover here, right? So of course, video game early on in your life, want to know how you got exposed to it. But then you actually took a very interesting turn. I see based on your LinkedIn profile that you got a bachelor's in genetics with yep. a minor in computer science. So yep. walk us through that journey. Gaming, how'd you get exposed to it? And siblings were they into technology early on? I mean, it's sort of like a time when things have started to hit, right? I mean, gaming has started to be more streamlined and available. You don't have to go play Taken or what was this, the Backstreet Fighter or something like that in arcades anymore. It's actually not available yeah. at your fingertips at home. So walk us through that journey, how you got exposed to gaming and why did you end up picking up genetics and that integration of all of that into computer science and coming into the sector? Yeah, it's all, it's, it's, it's all a very, very interwoven journey there. So in sixth grade, I read this article in National Geographic on sequencing the human genome. Maybe at that time, I think it was like That's you know, what it was you were like, reading in sixth grade. I I had God to read sakes. it for class. We had to read like my son. Had... My son is about to go into sixth grade, and that's not what he's reading. Well, we had to read some articles and do like a report on the article, and what it. we had around the house was National Geographic. So I always read National Geographic articles for them. And I read this and I was, and they made some reference of like, this is humans playing God or something to that effect. And I was like, I want to play God. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and I never got that idea out of my head. And especially as like somebody who likes to solve problems, you're like, well, if you could build humans from code, essentially, or anything, any life, all life we have on this planet is built from DNA, which is essentially a language like a computer language. If you could master that, you could build life. You could architect whatever you want. So that was a super fascinating idea for me, especially when I was just sort of learning about what code was and was able to put those two ideas together. Like, okay, well, DNA is the code of life. It's the computer code of life. So that never really got out of my head. And like I said, in high school, I was working at a bank doing IT and doing a little bit more mundane things, but learning how networking worked, at, you know, with the bank branches, we had a lot of frame relay, ISDN circuits, and getting into just basic system administration type stuff. And then when it came time for college, they now have a degree for this, by the way, the degree is called bioinformatics. But at the time that didn't exist because the first sequencing of the human genome was happening at that time. And so I was like, well, I really, I like genetics, but I also really like software. So how do I put those two things together? And it was do a degree in genetics and a minor in computer science. And at the time, the first bioinformatics class was actually being offered. I took the very first bioinformatics class ever offered at UC Davis and it was in Perl. And so it was doing, you know, working with DNA in Perl. Super, super cool stuff. And after that, I wanted to go work for Genentech. I wanted to work on shotgun DNA sequencing. I had this all planned out and I submitted for a job there and didn't get anything. And eventually I called, I don't know, I think I just called randomly until I got someone and got to talk to a recruiter. And I was like, hey, I want to come do this. And she kind of, she's like, well, what do you have right now? What are your qualifications? I told her I graduated with a bachelor's and all this. And she goes, well, 
to even be considered for somebody who would work on this upper level stuff, you have to have a PhD, you know, like what you're qualified no. for is basically like a lab assistant. And I was like, that was such a letdown for me. It was like an, it was like an earth shattering style letdown. Did you tell her that you looked at yourself as a God? Isn't that beyond <laughs> a PhD? I know, but I want to be a God. Come on. Um, <laughs> I'm a yeah, junior God. Does that not qualify me? Yeah. Come on. And so that just really, because I paid my own way through school and to think of doing that for another three or four years, we're earning my PhD. It was just, was like, I, at the time, it just seemed like a, a mountain too high to scale. And so I ended up, I was working at the time during college, I was working at Tower Records, like towerrecords.com. I worked on that with a group of folks. Oh my God. It was uh, super fun. For those of us that don't know what uh, Tower Records is, there, you, there used to be a store where you had to go and buy music. Like there was, a, music was at the store. It wasn't even in an app. It wasn't Napster. It wasn't iTunes. There was a store. You went to the store and you bought, did they sell cassette tapes in your day? It was probably CDs. CDs, yeah. Oh, oh records. <laughs> well, I mean, records. It was named <laughs> after records. So I imagine there were, there's still like, there was still a, like a, nobody really does the, oh man, I'm a real, I want an authentic cassette tape like mounted on the wall. People people love records for that uh, legacy kind of concept to it. But amazing that that you were at Tower Records. Yeah, it was super fun too. It was actually a pretty small group of us that built towerrecords.com. It was only really about eight people that did the coding, the system administration, the database administration, all that stuff. And at the time, towerrecords.com was bigger than Amazon for selling music. Like that is pretty, that's probably going to be pretty earth shattering to some folks, but it was huge. Wasn't it the same time that Napster actually came into existence as well? The late yep. 90s, yep. early 2000s. Yep. Same exact time. It was right during the confluence of everything going digital in music and the rise of Amazon and like, well, what we now know is the fall of Tower Records. But Tower was really fascinating because they actually had, I can tell you a fun story around this too. So one of the biggest tables in the database was the P-Song database. And that was all of the sound clips. We had, they had MP3 sound clips, actually, for a ton of music, which at the time was both controversial and very cutting edge. And so it was like 9 million records. And I accidentally, one time, because, I mean, remember, this is Wild Wild West days, right? So, you know, me in college had full access to everything in production. And I accidentally locked up the entire P-Song table by running a big delete operation on it. And it was pretty like, that is like one of my more traumatizing moments. And I still to this day, which it probably, it taught me something really good is like always before you hit enter on any sort of SQL on anything in production, you check it, you double check it, you type your update statements where, you know, you like. You never like terminate them properly. You type, you know, you type it out and you type update X where X and you don't fill in any of the variables first at all. So you can't possibly do any damage. You know, you've got to check it a million times before you actually hit enter. So it was a great lesson, but also highly traumatizing because I so had was it spend... Was it Napster and Amazon that led to the downfall of TowerRecords.com or was it Anna's misaligned operation? Uh, you know, tough to tell at this point. Tough to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a toss up. Yeah, it's a toss up, man. Yeah. And so one of the things we had wanted to do is we really wanted to put more MP3s out there. And it was really hard. I mean, Tower was probably one of the best positioned at the time to negotiate with the music labels to do that. And they wanted DCMA on everything. And so it was really at that. It, it was this huge point of contention that anything that was to be done legally that would have helped them, they wanted all of this copyright protection on that just made it almost impossible to use because you had to download like a specialized player do all this stuff that ultimately none of it survived anyway. And so it was fascinating time to be in the industry. I think the, it, it's got, it's got like, it's, it feels like very rhymey with blockbuster video and Netflix and that, that sort of thing. But what's so interesting about that perspective that I, I don't think most people kind of recognize from the outside looking in is that it gave you experience into how technology disrupts these longstanding brands. And yes, Tower Records, just like Blockbuster Video, when Blockbuster Video was able to acquire Netflix when, and they were begging them to acquire them, and they were like, ah, eh, this is never going to take off. It's just yeah. that, and, and that concept rings true in all other areas that we're not even necessarily thinking about, but it's a similar cadence where anything that can happen 
technology will eventually evolve to make it happen. And, but recognizing like the relationship between this kind of the, the traditional, which in any case, wherever you are in history, the way it's happening right now is what will become the traditional way it's done can be disrupted by these new processes that are only going to, you know, evolve. And you were there like when that first happened and, and that kind of makes you, uh, you call it the wild, wild west, tongue in cheek. We always talk about like the late nineties, early two thousands being the wild, wild west of all this stuff. Cause there was no database operations for dummies that you could look at. You had to learn by deleting that that's a bad thing to do live. Mm -hmm. But that experience is, is just, it, it, it makes you a pioneer. It's incredible. You know, it's interesting. That's a very interesting insight, actually. And it makes me think sort of about comparing the generations. I don't know if you've ever read any of the Malcolm Gladwell books, but one of the things that he points out is that there's sort of this golden generation that happened with a lot of the entrepreneurs out there that was in, in the, they were born in mid 70s to mid 80s because they had seen both a non-digital world and the technology future. And that gave them a really interesting perspective on things. And so I think that that insight into the fact that watching all of these huge disruption happen firsthand to sitting there and being like, being a kid that worked at Giant Tower Records, that was an icon, and sitting there and actually downloading MP3s and watching how the future was going to happen and watching that crumble, it actually gives you this weird sort of security and knowing that the smallest ideas can take down the biggest giants. And I wonder, and this really makes me wonder now about the current generation, is that they don't see that anymore, or at least not as much. What you see is these mega corporations. It's almost like we're back to the days of, of the monopolies, of the Ma Bells, the, of these mega corporations that just rule everything. And I can't help but wonder if the rates of depression and sort of hopelessness that the current generation feels is tied to that environment because you don't feel like it's a world where anything's possible anymore. Well, but then again, on the flip side, history repeats itself. So it's going to happen. So there's a lot of examples like Sears holding companies, another one, right? I mean, they had monopolized the entire distribution model. They were the largest warehousing company and then Amazon comes in and takes them over. And the same thing. But who's going to disrupt instance, Amazon now? Well, like, who knows, right? But then yeah. again, I mean, we didn't know that Amazon was going to actually ever happen, right? Yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. You, you've had competitors like Walmart and, and they're still trying to go after them. So who, who knows what's going to happen? But, but it, think, will, I, I, it will be disrupted. No doubt. And I think part of the thing, look, so much of the success of our generation in technology was right place, right time. There's just no doubt about it. Just like yeah. there were generations before, there were right place, right time where they can build career paths and everything feels like it's accelerating more rapidly. But I think what's missed, and I think to your point, is there's not a lot of, and this is, you know, this is one of the things that the Nomad Futurist Foundation tries to account for. There's not a lot of teaching the history of technology to the youth. And I think that maybe history doesn't repeat itself, but we are, history rhymes. So I think understanding the concepts, the, the stories of the tower records, the disruption of the, the blockbuster videos and Sears and, and, and all that, those are hugely important, not just from a business perspective, but from a technology perspective in how technology evolves. And it goes even further beyond that. You, know, you talk about shifting the IRQs to make your doom playing better. I think the concept of software folks, because of the rise of AWS and Google Cloud are so, so many layers obfuscated from where the physical infrastructure mm -hmm. is, that there's no longer a realization that you have to understand how hardware works in order to create an application. And that inherently kind of dilutes the value of your knowledge because the, what I tell people that are focused on app development today, and you'll, you might yell at me for this, is that like app development programming, and I started out as a programming major in school also, I quickly realized that my mind just doesn't work that way because I'm really not that bright. It, but it's the first thing that's going to be disrupted by AI tools because so much of it is repeatable and so much of it is relational based that can be kind of programmed to, to do 99% of the work. So the real value is going to be an understanding both how the users leverage the application and how the hardware responds to the code. And if you don't have access and understanding of hardware because AWS and Google Compute and Azure 
has really obfuscated the idea of compute or physical infrastructure from you, it becomes a lost art. Yeah, I really agree with that. And it's a totally interesting point is that I, cause I've played around with GPT, Gemini for code generation, and it does a pretty good job, but you really need the expertise to take it from a pretty good job to a finished product. And it has been for a long time that app development is very, very, very far obscured from the infrastructure and it's only getting more so. And if the value that humans are going to add on top of AI is, is in bridging that gap, is in adding the last, whether you want to call it 5%, 2%, whatever it is to the code. And that's not what we're geared, you know, that's not what we're gearing our educational system for, or even just the current environment for software development isn't geared towards that. How is that going to happen? Well, that's why we're going to continue talking about that and can't wait to launch the academies to make it easier. What are your thoughts on brain computer interfaces and then that being them. integrated? I that love being integrated them. In I love them. I, I have a couple right now. <laughs> I, lo I love them. I wish I could have one right now. It's actually super fascinating. And I believe, I actually firmly believe this is that it's the only way forward for the human race. Because when you look at thinking about humans, from if you think about humans as like in terms of data, because the whole world is data, right? There's a lot of stuff coming out in, in physics and quantum mechanics to say that information is actually the only base thing that exists anywhere in the universe, right? So if you think of humans in terms of data and what our protocols are like for exchanging data, we are an extremely lossy data store, right? Our brains are ephemeral storage only. All of the data in them gets lost on death. The only protocols that we have for exchanging information are, you know, we didn't have any for a long time. Then we had language, a little bit better. You know, you get what, 98% packet loss with that. You know, you're getting maybe 2% of actual data transmitted between generations. Then we go to written language. So you're getting a little bit better. Maybe it's 80% packet loss. You're actually successfully transmitting 20% of that data between generations. Well, the only, and even as a, transmission protocol written or spoken i don't know how many words a minute somebody can it's like i type what 100 some odd words per minute that's awful mm -hmm. like in terms of like what is that if you consider a word a bit that's like a, a little over a bit and a half maybe two bits a, a minute at best of like data transmission like it's it's horrible and now we're creating ai that can actually transmit data at real speeds, gigabit of information per second speeds, how are we ever going to interface with something like that and really use it to its full potential using typing, which we are like language, like any sort of language is exceptionally slow. And it's also very lost. Like think of it not just in terms of like how fast can we transmit, but language is also a very lossy protocol because the more specific words you use, the less lossy it becomes. But the, so it's the less specific words you use, the more lossy it is. Like if I were to describe a door to you, well, it's a big rectangular thing. I don't know, that could be a lot of stuff, right? And so we have to have door as the more specific word because that allows us to transmit more data faster. So you have to have actually an incredibly great vocabulary in order to really truly be efficient at data transmission. Well, and then there is this element of data translation and a uniform dictionary as well, which we don't have as human. Yeah. So with yeah. BCI, you create that level of standardization that everyone speaks the same thing and, or at least there's a unit conversion. Yeah. Tower of Babel, God has spoken. <laughs> I think, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone talk about like the interaction of humans and kind of network parlance in terms of packet loss. And I think it's a brilliant way to look at it. And you may have sold me on the concept of allowing Elon Musk to throw a neural link in my brain. Maybe not him. Maybe if there's someone, someone else that was just a little less diabolical, but that's a new you know, startup, Phil. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah exactly. To babble. We could call it babble. You start up uh, right no, here. I think that was taken, but uh, I said this the first time we've, we ever spoke on the phone. I was like, disruptors unite. And I still feel that way today, all these years later. Have you ever seen that show on Amazon Prime, Upload? Yes, yes. Right. I didn't watch so that. There, that's there's great. something brilliant about this concept of like all the information that's in your brain 
being able to be uploaded somewhere because you've been a part of M&A, obviously, with all of your startups. Oh, and yeah. the one thing you always talk about in the concept of whether you're acquiring a site or acquiring a business or just acquiring some you know, subsection of a business is who's going to come along that has that institutional knowledge. It's this concept of institutional knowledge that is yep. hugely valuable, which is kind of why people don't document a lot of their stuff because that's their job security is to like keep all of that stuff insulated instead of like in a wiki somewhere. But if we had the ability, think of all the institutional knowledge to your point that's lost by people that die, that you oh, basically so spend thousands of years trying to recreate, like you start and maybe you get half the way there and somebody had the answer to it, but you got to start from the beginning because you don't have any way to interface with that kind of unfinished work. And, you know, it's amazing to think about. Yeah. At, at a species level, we have a problem. When I say we're only ephemeral storage, that's it. If every person on earth got wiped out today, except for one, the amount of knowledge that would be carried forward is infinitesimally small. You know, it is, it is nothing. There is a movie for that. That's called Idiocracy. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean the documentary? Idiot. The documentary, exactly. Weird. By the way, I will still tell you this better than most of the other species. But yeah. Uh, yes, but I don't. Hopefully. Yes, hopefully better. Yeah, trees. But... Actually, trees might be better at it than, than we are. So, what do you think, Anna? It's that turnover where brain computer interfaces and collaboration with AGI and the quantum leap are streamlined. That we're, is, is it going to happen in our life? based on your experience, or we're out 50, 60 years? There's two very different versions of this, right? There's, I guess, because I'm an optimist and I'm always hopeful because you have to be kind of an optimistic idiot to do startups over and over again. I want to say that it's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen in our lifetimes, but that's because I so badly want to see it. But you, you know, also would... can't be proven wrong. And what's going to happen? Okay, you'll die. Oh, shit, she was wrong. Well, too bad. <laughs> oh, oh, well. <laughs> Well, after we are dead, who cares? <laughs> yeah. Unless, I know, and like, in, unless we can figure out some way to transmit, you know, our, our knowledge, our consciousness into hard storage, then it becomes a different game. Enter well, the floppy disk. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think the reason why I asked that question is because like, as of this year, I, with the large language models and artificial intelligence, where we're at today is that I believe what a human brain does is now accessible and or viable through these large language models. And with the, with the pace of the innovation that we are seeing and what I've been reading is by 2035, 2040, we should be able to fully comprehend the human race, which means, which means that by that point in time, quantum, not just the compute, but the quantum internet, the quantum universe is going to come into existence. And potentially by that time, we will have this brain computer interfaces that we can start transmitting data I, and leaving memories. Like I said, I, I hope so. It's, it's super exciting. There's a couple of general trends that I would turn to, I think, for a more realistic picture of it is that in general, technology has a habit of going very slow until it goes very fast. It's generally long, long periods of exploration and and then all of a sudden a discovery is made and things accelerate very rapidly. And so I don't see any reason why the patterns behind this would be any different. We'll see a lot of stuff that has a very long tail or very long lead into it, and then it will explode. And then there's also, if you look at Moore's Law or anything else, is that everything technology-wise just grows at this exponential curve. And I think that that also explains the long lead into it is, you know, the, the logarithmic style curve is that you have this long lead and then things just take off. And so the question really is, is when will we hit that inflection point that things start the logarithmic growth, whether it's with quantum computing or BCI or whatever the case is, when that happens, because the second that that happens, we can be sure that innovation is going to happen at a much faster pace than it ever has before. And we see the same thing with LLMs right now, which LLMs are an interesting topic to me because I'm very born on, the, on those and what they, what they mean to like AGI and our future and all this. Because it's like on, on one half, I think, well, it's just a, it's just a probability model, right? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, great. We have a fancy probability model that does some neat tricks with language. But on the other hand, you look at sort of these emergent properties that come out of the LLMs that 
even the researchers can explain and the fact that they there seems to be like the larger data sets that you train them on the more quote unquote common sense which is a hard thing to quantify that they seem to have and be able to answer more increasingly abstract questions even better and so it's like what's that is that an emergent property is that the same thing that we see within what we consider intelligence is, are we starting to get there or not i i don't know it's such a fascinating space yeah like i think the concept of just being able to essentially continue to manipulate and look through a, an infinitely sized data set will inevitably create trends that we're not necessarily able to predict because that's the whole point the whole yeah. point is that of this technology is that we lack the capacity singularly to be able to kind of analyze this size data set, no matter how you know smart one is or well-read one is, there's just a limit because we have to like sleep assholes yeah. that we are. I, I wanted to get to this before we lose time, which is going back. We talked about like, as a sixth grader, you read that article on the genome. Were you always interested in technology? Like even as, as, as an even younger child? And is that born out of what your parents did for a living and, and, and where you grew up and stuff? How, how did you even get to the point where that was an interesting article for you to read? I don't know. Good quick. Um, well, my mom, we're was going there. way back. What, I know this is, this is in the is, crib. Yes. This is, yeah, crib? this is if way you start back. crying, way back, by the way, we said I want to turn this into as much of a <laughs> Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters type yeah. interview style as possible. All right, good. Yeah, let's get to the hard hitting yeah, questions. Yeah. You know, is it really journalism unless there's tears? I don't yeah, think so. I, I don't think so. I do yeah. have some some Well, that's uh, when Trump says I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so going way back, yeah, my mom Engl was an English professor. My dad was also a teacher. So I guess I maybe there was a unique sort of slant on how I grew up there is that it was a lot of educational stuff in the household always. My favorite books to look when I was a kid was, I don't even know what set they were, but it was all, all of the classical artists, Matisse, Monet, Van Gogh. That was my, some of my favorite things to look at was read about. And like when I first learned to read was reading about those artists. And then we had like a whole different set on science, dinosaurs, all those things. So I guess that I, there was always a focus there on the, what we now call STEAM, which is science and art. So I always had that in my life, even from a very young age. So Maybe I was very fortunate that way. And I don't know that because computers were just coming around. The internet was, I first got on the internet in high school. But one thing, even when you're young and you don't know anything about anything yet or what the world should look like, I still feel like when something's very uniquely special. And the first time I got the taste of the internet and actually even farther back from that, my dad had this good friend who they had a cabin way up in the mountains and him and his wife one time when I was younger, probably like seven or something, they took me up there for the weekend for hiking or whatever. And my dad's friend was a programmer at IBM. And we got on the computer and using just like, you know, a, a talk, I think on, on Linux, on the command line, we were able to talk to my dad because we had a computer at home, even back then, 9,600 baud modem. And I was able to talk to my dad. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. Like the fact that I can type stuff on this keyboard and my dad can respond back is absolutely mind-blowing like and and it also felt incredibly native too so it's weird to have something both be incredibly impressive and feel like this is natural why doesn't everything work like this like why can't i just talk to whoever of course I want, this whenever should be i want the way you communicate yeah right? like of course this should be it like i don't understand why i'm not talking to everybody like this and so it's a very interesting paradox to have something feel completely impressive and yet totally natural. And so that definitely, I think, gives you like the key into when a technology is good. Because when you think about your iPhone, isn't that sort of how an iPhone always felt is that it's both mind blowing and incredibly natural. And so every step along the way from there and to first getting on the internet and getting on like BBSs back even from home and IRC in high school, it was like, okay, yes, this is finally happening. Like, how is this taking so long? Why can't it go faster? <laughs> Special place to anyone after listening to this episode who immediately can tell us what IRC stands for or what BBS stands for. Yeah, they might be getting a Nomad Futurist pen or a shirt. Right. Uh, and exactly. a question for you, as it entails, I mean, do, do you have any siblings? Uh, yeah, I have a brother. I have a stepsister and two stepbrothers. Any of them in the technology sector? Most of them. Um, 
So my uh, my brother, he runs QA for the HP Proker line of switches, which is now, I think he does Aruba also since the acquisition. But the packet loss conversations in your family must be just rich. <laughs> we, have, we have some good conversation. My stepbrother has a master's in information security. And so he is usually, so he is a security architect. At, he's done a lot of large financial institutions. I think now he's... Just make sure he's aware he still couldn't get that job with the genetics company because he nice, doesn't have a big enough degree. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, buddy. You're, you're lacking there. <laughs> and then I guess my other two siblings, one's a farmer and then my sister is, she's chief of staff for like the undersecretary of the interior. She's very high up in the, in the governmental world. Brilliant. Would you say, and, and, and again, this is sort of like my theory, that you are who you are based on the education, exposure, and the experiences that you got. That's it. This is, this, you're asking the whole nature. You're asking where I am on the nature versus nurture debate, right? Okay, that's, that's tough, man. It's even tougher since I have kids now. I don't know. I feel like I would have given a more confident answer to this before I had children of my own. Now I feel less confident in anything that I say because when you're so close to something, you tend to make observations that you haven't made before. And I, I want to, like, I don't know. I still think the classic, like, it's 50-50 is maybe not far off from the truth because there are certain things that I see in my children and the children, their good friends around them, where it does seem so ingrained that that's just, that they are who they are. And at the same time, they're still so flexible and can change almost anything. So, I, oh. <laughs> that's a, what, it's, what, it's a, what, what would your one. answer have been before you had kids? I think before I had kids, I would have actually gone a little bit more towards, just because of my background in genetics, I would have gone more towards that. A lot of it's ingrained. And like kind of you can't fight some of your genetic, your eyes are blue. You can't make them green. Well, um, actually, these days you can. But I know it's, um, <laughs> yes, yes, these days you can. But I think that that I think that that's changed a little bit. And even I'm giving. Just, I'm still. I, are you, I'm listening to your story. I'm giving a lot of credit to that uh, friend of your dad's who had the place in the woods. But yes, I guess it was all ingrained there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like. Ah. Uh, yeah. That's why it's such a very tough question. And I think even with more recent advances in our understanding of how genetics works, because before epigenetics, when I was in school, it was like epigenetics was maybe a word I heard once, like nobody really understood it. And there's been so many advances lately in understanding how This might be the first time I've ever heard it. In class. So epigenetics is methylation patterns on DNA that basically influence how it's expressed. So it's not just necessarily the genetic code, but it's a layer on top of it that also influences how it is expressed. And so if you think of like DNA as the language, epigenetics is part of the grammar for that. And also part of the grammar for that that's coming out too is in how genes are expressed. It's not just necessarily epigenetics, but there's all these like certain things that will promote a gene's expression or inhibit it. And it used to be thought of that it was very simple, right? Well, you put a promoter at the front start of the sequence and you get more of that gene expression. And now it's understood, and this is very like very recent, very cutting edge that, you know, where those promoters or inhibitors are on the DNA sequence actually make a big difference. So it is grammatical in the way, in the sense that where it is in the sequence of words and changes the meaning. So we're actually discovering right now a lot of things that even even genetics is a very fluid thing it, and it's very nuanced in its expression. So yeah, I don't know. You know I'm starting you know what to I just learn. You know what I just <laughs> learned? What I just learned is they should have given you that goddamn job. <laughs> Right. I still feel that same way too. I would have like, I would have loved to do that, but I also wouldn't have been pushed. But then there'd be no packet fabric. Yeah. I wouldn't have been pushed into the software world so quickly if that hadn't happened. If I hadn't heard that, I wouldn't have been like, well, I like software. Maybe I should make the most out of this because at the time I had gotten a raise from starting as like a junior programmer to being like a mid and then basically a senior all in like pretty fast succession through college. And I was like, this, like this world, whatever this world is, thinks fast and forward and it goes and it allows me an opportunity without having a PhD to go in and do stuff and make a real, real difference. So. Yeah, I think that there's, there's no question. You clearly have a personality that feels like it would have been stifled in the kind of bureaucratic closed off, a highly regulated type of atmosphere that would be like a biogenetic type of environment. 
but also maybe that's what those environments need is more people right. oh, like oh, me. Oh, there's, there's, there's no doubt. It's, uh, can, you, can you fix it from the inside or do they just need to listen to this podcast and change? <laughs> well, well yeah, I mean, who look, knows? At, look at BCI, right? We we're just talking about that. It took Musk to do that. When I was in college, there was already experiments going on with brain computer interface implants for paraplegics. Exactly the same thing Musk was going after. This was so long ago and it was never pursued because it's like, oh, I don't know. These are kind of scary and they're not very ethical. Yeah. And it took somebody to just go, screw it. We're doing this. Right. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's maybe it's time for that, Genentech yeah, but... to call on you and help develop the BCI. Um, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've got kids. You've had a phenomenal career. You've done some startups. You're involved in the software business. What will you tell the younger you? What, what do you tell the younger kids or your kids for that matter? Ooh. So, well, the younger you, I think that there's two very different answers here because the younger me, the answer is very tailored to me. But then the younger generation in, in general, I think is slightly, slightly different. For, for younger me, and maybe this would apply to a lot, is, is confidence. Having the confidence to believe in yourself having the confidence to put your ideas out there. It's tough when you're younger. I always was riddled with like, oh, should I speak up on this? Like, I'm not sure that I really know what I'm talking about. And I think it's better to err on the side of being brash and coming across as like cocky or any of those things rather than to stay quiet and just not have the experience of at least getting the feedback as to are you an idiot or is it a good idea? Because unless you put it out there, you're never going to know. Turns out the answer is nobody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And that is kind of the big secret, too. And I think as you get older, you do realize that it, it's actually the things that you were so sure about in youth or that you thought you knew, even those tend to evaporate. And you realize that nobody really knows anything. and especially the more expert you become on a topic, you sort of, it's almost this flip that happens to where it's like you hit a certain point where you're like, I know a lot. And then you hit, hit a certain point where you're like, no, I really don't. I, I don't know anything. Nobody really knows anything. <laughs> so that's maybe to myself. And I think that that would probably benefit definitely some section of the younger generation out there. In general, though, one of the things that I would like to do for the younger generation is influence young girls to get into the STEM careers, because this question comes up to me not infrequently is, you know, how do we get more women in tech? Well, there's only 20% of women graduating with computer science degrees or STEM degrees. You can't hire what's not there. What we have is a pipeline problem. And there's actually been studies on this, and anybody can go look it up, is that most girls tend to lose interest in science, math, technology around like the fourth to seventh grade area. And so that's the biggest possible area of impact that you can have. So my advice to specifically younger generation, especially in that age range, is that tech is amazing and, and wonderful. And it op offers so many opportunities to have, especially with a family or whatever your other life goals are too, that you should not ignore it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it is that they tend to lose interest fourth to seventh grade? Is it the society's expectation that they're putting? Is it, is it Taylor Swift? You can blame her. It's fine. I would never blame Tay Tay. <laughs> I, that's a good, I think if I had that answer, I could probably no, like. I figured I'd ask. I mean, you are God after all. So I figured I, guess, I don't true. get very many chances to ask God a question. Well, I think well, I, if I may answer that, right, I think it's probably- Who's got a better so. perspective on what a young girl is going through than Nabil? Yes, please. Andrew. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think we have made it, we, 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 we have a tendency of making it so complicated that the people lose interest. So we got to keep it simple to the point and encourage people to come in. I mean, I walked away from taking a C++ after three minutes of going to school that that wasn't for me. And here we are 25 years later. So- we have not done a good job with our narrative. We have not done a good job with the educational system. And we continue to make it extremely complicated whereby people lose interest. I think people see Elon Musk and people don't see Anna Claiborne. And I think they need to see more Anna Claiborne. So I think the way you get more is to be out there, is that there, you are like brilliant, strong, confident, right? And I think the, the world needs more examples of you to inspire 
people to to follow in in your footsteps. And I think part of that is also the education system, making sure that it tells the story, not just of the Albert Einsteins of the world and some of the male dominated technology innovators, but of the powerful women that have also made their mark on technology innovation. And I, I just don't think it's, you know, you go past whether DEI is just a checkbox that you talk about versus whether you want appropriate representation in what society is taught. And I think it's important that role models like yourselves are given a platform equal to their male counterparts. But what the yeah, hell do I know? I agree with you. And that sort of gets into a bit of chicken and the egg problem, right? Because it's how many women role models are there out there for young girls? You know, it's, it's kind of few. And how do you get them better highlighted to two girls in the first place. I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that on a small scale, what I can do and what I do do is I go and I talk to both my daughter and my son's classes about technology. And I always make a point to do that because it's like, well, I might not be able to change the entire system. Maybe I can change the system for one person in that class. Maybe I can make one person in their classroom see things differently because I'm physically there and talking to them. And, and which is kind of like, I, again, back to being a hopeless optimist, you know, I always believe you change one person, you change the world. So I can't change the world, but I certainly have enough ability to go change one person. So that's what I'll continue to try and do. And also on the yeah. Einstein thing. Yeah. So his wife, Maleva, I don't really know how to pronounce her name, but I, and it's like, is Maleva or M-I-L-E-V-A. All, nearly all of Einstein's most prolific work came during the time that he was married to her she did better than him in university she was a better student she had like everyone pretty much knew that she was downright brilliant and i think it's very fascinating that it's not talked about more the fact that his best work was produced when he was married to her and after that it dropped off almost into nothing who you know it's like has it will obviously never be able to know the answer to this but chances are she played a pretty big role in his work. And also because at the time, if it had come out under her name, no one ever would have paid attention to it. So we have nowhere to know like where on the spectrum, like did she do everything? Did she write all of his papers? Was she a contributor? Like we don't even really know that. And it, her name never even occurs. And this plays directly into the fact of like, yeah, you know, there is still a societal problem here mm -hmm. that we don't address well is that women are chronically underrepresented in as being, you know, these amazing historical figures in science and technology. And so. It does feel like we should start an organization or an initiative in her name. Ooh, just, that'd be I a love good it. one. I, yeah. I think we are doing that now. I think we're doing it. And Anna <laughs> is going to have to chair it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you're amazing. What can I say? An inspiration oh, thank to me you. And, and, and I'm sure to anyone that, that, that will listen to this. Well, I hope so. I hope, I hope I said at least something worthwhile for those who have so graciously donated their time to listening to this episode. I mean, and to the extent that they don't believe it, you guys just heard the voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. I never got the chance. Remember? I was so close. Your days are... Yeah. We, we, you're an optimist. We're not. That, I, I imagine Genentech is going to call you after this podcast airs. There's still time. There is still time. There is there's, still time. There's still time. Anna, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Any final thoughts or message you'd like to share with the audience, maybe the folks at Genentech and the younger students? You missed out for Genentech. Right. No, but I, I think specifically for the younger students and anyone out there who has girls in that age range who is in tech, which I can imagine is a lot of the audience for this podcast, is do what you can. If you truly want to do something to help women in tech go into and talk to middle school girls about technology, talk to them about how great it is, talk to them about careers, talk about literally anything and give them encouragement. Because if there's one way we're going to change the dynamic is by addressing the root cause. So that would be my, my call to action there is do what you can, because even on a small scale, it makes big impacts. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It was lovely to finally get to meet you. Can't wait to meet you in person. Neville, it's great to meet you too, Phil. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been great. Always a pleasure, Anna. All right. Thanks, guys. This has been great. 
nothing lasts forever. Markets will come back, currencies will rebound, businesses will go on, and we will all move on. That could happen next week, next month, or next year. At Nomad Futures, we are confident that those who prepare rather than panic will come out of this stronger. Thank you for joining us. This has been brought to you by Nomad Futurist. Check us online at nomadfuturist.org. And thank you for listening and subscribing as well as your continued support.